everybody for having come. Thank you really, uh, especially with such a short notice. And uh, this is uh, a talk I have uh, already given one time in, uh, in Southampton and I was uh, going to give, to give again over here, also to get some feedbacks and also because uh, there might be people over here with which I will collaborate in future. And uh, the discussion, the, the talk is about uh, a different way to, to reach consensus among some people. So if you have a group of people and they have an issue and they have to discuss something, this is another way with which they can try to find a, a, an agreement between them. If you look at how we normally reach agreements in, uh, in our society, if we want to... The, the democratic way of, uh, of, uh, using, of uh, reaching an agreement is uh, through voting which means everybody, someone decides what are the options, then everybody votes on those options, and whoever has the majority, we go with that. There, in the last uh, 300 years, there have been quite a lot of discussion about uh, how the various, way, the various ways in which a democracy can be set up, where people can vote for multiple options at the same time. So, for example, I'm happy with this option, or with this option, or with this option, and so on, or where people just vote for a single option, and, and the issue was uh, was present already in um, at the times of uh, of Rome. There is uh, there are some stories about it. So so it's it's an old issue, and if you look at the way in which democracy is set up right now, there are a lot of uh, all the things that we are bringing on right now. Whereas in some ways we could uh, probably do it better. And one of my main points is that the technology that you have, the technology that is at the base of your society, in a sense define what, it, what your society is able to do, and so also define what kind of, uh, what kind of democracy you are having over there. I give you an example. In, uh, in the United States, when you are electing the president, uh, you, when the Americans are electing the presidents, they don't elect the president directly. They elect a body of people who then vote for the president. And they vote 40, day, 40 days later. Now, why 40 days later and why they are not voting directly? Well, when they set it up, there were some logistical problems. And so the time between the people, the moment in which people were voting and the moment in which those people were actually voting for the president was uh, the 40 days was needed for the person from the fastest away place to go to Washington by horse back. And a similar story actually exists in, um, in Ireland where, uh, um, where Irish uh, parliamentary people uh, only the parliament is only open two days a week because uh, they need uh, one day to go back uh, to the region where they uh, where they came from uh, one day to discuss with everybody else and then you have the weekend of course and then one day to come back so you take away three days uh, plus two days of the weekend that's five days uh, seven minus five is uh, two so so and of course it takes them two day one day to go there by horseback. And there are lots of, uh, of similar examples all around, all around the world. Now, so, so where does this work particularly come from? This work uh, has uh, multiple roots. One of the, of the root uh, is, uh, is over here, is about collaborative democracy and e-democracy. Because right now, with the new technology, we are suddenly realizing that uh, we, we would be able to do a lot of things that before were only dreamt of. For example, you could set up a, a direct democracy where everybody every evening would just go home, look at what are the issues and vote on them directly. This would be very, very easy to set up. Now, there's a lot of critics against direct democracy. I am not suggesting that, but I am saying now it is possible, before it wasn't. Um, and then, as we said, voting theory, as we said, is, is one of the roots. 
but uh, there are some assumptions that are at the base of voting theory, and those are assumptions that are uh, that we reject in this work, and we are trying actually to to look at other options that are there once we reject those assumptions. We will look at those assumptions in the next slide. What's voting theory? Voting theory is that, uh, is that body of knowledge that has been developed, uh, started to be developed essentially after the French Revolution when they realized that the way in which people vote, I mean the, the actual mechanism of the democracy had, an, uh, had a real big effect on the, on the uh, what was coming out of a democratic election. So, for example, you have to choose what is the person in a, in a particular, uh, uh, at head of a particular body, for example, uh, I don't know, the prime minister or whatever. Now, everybody can vote one name, and that's one way. Another way is everybody can vote for any possible name they would be happy with. Another way is you vote for all the possible, uh, you vote on all the possibilities, but you order them from the one you prefer to the one that you prefer most to the one you prefer least. Those are three different ways for you to vote. And then there are different ways for the algorithm to compute the votes. You can just pick the maximum or you can take away the people who have uh, voted for someone who has no option to become elected and then if they have chosen a second person, just use their second choice and so on. So there are, there are multiple options about it. In fact, I think that the straight direct option where people just write one candidate and who has the majority comes out, that's pretty much assumed to give you a, a, a fairly bad result. Because people will generally vote for the uh, least worse that has some possibilities to, to be elected. I think you know the problem because it's very common in, uh, in Western democracies, but not all Western democracies use, uh, use this system. For example, in the United Nations, when they have to choose the secretary, everybody writes all the names that they are happy with. Uh, and then the person that uh, comes out with more names, is, uh, with more votes, uh, comes out. This is a, a better solution. Uh, it does not give you, there are some solutions that are called uh, um, Forgive me, I don't remember the name, but they are, that are the mathematical, that can be proven as the mathematical best, and this is not the issue. The United Nations is not a very good example of football, essentially. Sorry? The United Nations is not a very good example as a democratic process. There are uh, implications there. Uh, maybe not respect to, the, to uh, all, the, all the earth. Respect to the people that voted is actually not so bad. Now, let's, let's go on. So, essentially, a lot of uh, the root of all this was uh, how should the democracy of the 21st century look like? I mean, we are using a, a, an 18th century democracy. How, considering the technology that we have right now, can we build something better? And, and eventually also, how should we organize a society? And now, as I'm speaking about a society, this is not necessarily speaking about a nation. You can also use systems like this if you want to define inside, I don't know, inside a society as, a, you know, um, an industry, for example, or a, or a corporation or whatever, a group of people that need to decide something. And so the whole point where everything is trying, everybody is trying to reach an agreement is how, given a question, can we find an answer to which we all agree? We should agree as much as possible, Well, we'll try to get something which is even more than as much as possible. We'll try to get that everybody agrees to it. This is not always possible, this but... Vote is unanimous. Sorry? Is, uh, is, uh, I try to give the notion of, of all, all the... We are, uh, synonymous to unanimous. we are trying to, to reach a, a solution which is uh, unanimous. It will not always be possible, but it might be possible every now and then. Now, those are the assumptions that uh, we have in, uh, in, in voting at the, in the, at the present time. Now, the first one is that all votes are equivalent. And also, whoever votes uh, 
your uh, a vote of one person or another are the same. We don't uh, look at uh, uh, various people and say that the vote of a person is, a, is more important than the vote of another person. And, uh, and that the second, and I think is the biggest mistake that we are using, that we are doing, is that uh, we know what are the possibilities. Uh, someone at the beginning is able to look at a question and say, okay, those are the possible answers to this question. So let's actually just vote between them who chooses one and who chooses the other. And once we have those two big assumptions, then there is nothing left to do but actually try to convince the other person that their position was wrong and they actually have to come to our position or start to offend the other person by saying that they are actually stupid or they are uh, Italian, in Italian politics and people came out with all sorts of uh, uh, nasty name for each other and uh, in the US also and so on. It's, uh, eventually those hardly are able to convince people to change a side. So they, this doesn't really work very well. Uh, here there is something about voting theory and about different ways. You can have one or two rounds, you can have one preference and preference, you can order the solution and so on. And, and essentially you have, as you can see over there, some people which are a minority are the proposers, are the, the people who actually are able to write the, the, the possible solutions and then everybody else vote on them. The power that we write the proposal, so who is in power is able to write those proposals, everybody else is, uh, is, uh, has not this power. And then whichever proposal has more votes is generally implemented. There can be different types, but essentially one of those proposals is implemented. And all this risks uh, uh, something which is well known, which is a, tyr a tyranny of the majority, and there's a sort of uh, check and balance in democracy trying to limit this power. Let's look at the, the three basic main issues that we are trying to see if we can uh, do, away to, do away without them. The first one is, uh, we know what are the possibilities. Now, uh, a lot of people over here have been working on genetic algorithm. We know from genetic algorithm that whatever you think that the solution is, whatever you think are the best solution, often are not the best solution, and the algorithm will be able to find better solution. If it's an interesting problem, that's the case. And uh, reality has a lot of much more interesting problems, and everybody that, that tries to, to come up with solutions often will find that there was a maybe a more complex solution that would uh, find a different uh, compromise between, uh, uh, between existing element that was actually, that was actually possible. So we, we, tr we refuse the idea that we know what are the possibilities and we actually take the idea that we are looking for the possibilities through a, an approximation process. We, we give some approximation and then we apply them more and we, we try to approximate more and more solutions that, are, that, have, uh, um, that, that people like. And, and so our assumption is, is that, that there is a solution somewhere and there is a solution that would get a, a vast, vast majority to support it, if not even to have everybody supporting it. And, and, and the other is that we don't have to convince other people that our position is the best, because we actually need other people to help us find this solution. And so the way to implement all this is your genetic algorithm. And the way you do, we are going to do it is to do it through a human-based genetic algorithm. That is, human provide the variation, provide the possibilities, human provide the fitness measure by voting, and, uh, and then the algorithm decides which proposals go from one generation to the other. So we discard some proposals as unfit, we keep the other's proposal, they reach the next generation, and then we move on. A human-based genetic algorithm is, uh, is the solution that I'm proposing, where people provide for variability, people provide for the fitness measure, and the algorithm decides what reaches the next generation. So let's look at one after the other, the various options. People provide for variabilities. So there are not only few people that propose something, everybody can propose it, and then at the next generation, when the new 
the order, uh, the people, the solution from the past generation are, are passed on again. Uh, people are invited to modify them so that, uh, you know, I, I didn't vote for this one for this and this reason, but uh, I would have voted it if uh, this was true, so they could actually rewrite it in a way that would fit uh, their desires and integrate them. Everybody, and from this point of view, everybody can be a compromiser, so it's a, a person who is trying to find a middle ground or they can ignore them and just present a new, new possibility exam. Or they can recover past proposals and modify those as well. So there is a lot of freedom, but there is some sort of general invitation of going uh, in a particular direction. So, the fitness measure is each user's vote. So we, can, we want multiple viewpoints and we want each user to evaluate each proposed answer and we want to retain information. We said before that one of the assumptions in the normal voting, in the normal voting uh, uh, way is that every vote is equivalent, so you can sum them up. Now, the fact is that every person has a different experience. I'm not here saying that a person is more important or less important than another. I am saying that you cannot just sum up voting from different people because they mean different things. When you sum up voting from different people, you are losing information, information that can be important. So how do you, uh, how do you compare uh, the various proposals if you do not sum up the votes? And, uh, and it should be simple to use. So from the, voting, from the point of view of the person who is voting, it will be simple. So the solution is that each user votes on all the solution he endorses and, and alternatively there are two possibilities. They can rate them or they can order them. What do I mean is that it can be a 0-1, people just endorse some solution or it can be that you go to all the proposal, to all the solution, and on each of them you say how much I like that. You know, it's out of 1 to 10, I like it so much, or I just order them from the one I like most to the one I like least. So, let's suppose that we have done it. Now, for each answer, we're going to have a list of users that endorse them or a rating. And we do not sum the votes, we, don't, we do not sum the ratings. We keep each solution evaluation as a point in a multidimensional space. What do I mean? Every solution becomes a point in a multidimensional space. Each, each user provides one of the dimensions. So in this example over here we have uh, three users uh, that are called X, Y and Z. And, uh, and they have rated this solution in different ways. And, this is, and so we are keeping this uh, solution as a point over there. And now, if, we are only, uh, if they are rating, we can do it in this way. If they are just supporting, we will do it by putting a value of 1. If they do not endorse this, then the value will be of 0. And if you're using the, uh, the rating, the rating will be the value. Now, the problem is, uh, what goes on to the next generation? Once we have uh, all those uh, solutions that they are all rated, how do we decide which of them pass to the next generation? So we do not need uh, to associate to each, to each solution a number. We just need to divide uh, the solution into two big uh, groups. Uh, the one that are saved, that will pass to the next generation, and the one that are going to be lost. So let's give an example, and we're going to give an example in two dimensions simply because it's easier to draw it. So let's suppose that we have John and Jane. And so John is over here, he has rated all the solutions over here in, in blue, while Jane is rating all the solutions in red. 
you can see, for example, that now it's also possible to rate some solution in the same way. Look how C and G over here has the same rating. It's absolutely acceptable. Now, the question is, which of those solutions should be keep and which should we should be discard? This is what you are not doing, summing or multiplying the values. Uh, but instead, we are going to eliminate the dominated ones. So there are some of those solutions that are going to be eliminated. How? Well, look at solution A. Solution A is worse than solution B, both for John and for Jane. Both John and Jane prefer solution B to solution A. So we can eliminate solution A. Similarly, solution F is worse than solution C because both Jane and John prefer uh, C to F. And E is worse than both of B and D. And D is worse of C. So, by the way, here you see that there is also transitivity. And uh, G is worse than C because for Jane is the same, but for John, one is worse than the other. So because, uh, and, uh, because for Jane is the same, and Jane does not mind if, it's going, if we are going to keep a G or C. Whereas John does mind, so we are actually going to keep C. And so if we look at those three solutions, H, C, and B, essentially any solution which, which is inside this area is going to be dominated. And, uh, and we are going to ignore it. Whereas uh, those three solutions represent uh, what is called a Pareto frontier or a Pareto front, which is a concept in economics. And uh, so we started from all those solutions and we kept those three, ignoring the other. So again, we have end users and solutions. We see each solution as a point in Iran, we have n points, and we eliminate the dominated ones, and we burn them, in this case, and the one that remains are uh, the Pareto frontier. And each time that the user can suggest... After this, we take those solutions, we give them back, and we ask people if they want to modify them, if they want to combine them, trying to find a compromise, if they want to ignore it and just try the new solutions, or they want to recover an old solution, there was a solution over here, and modify that as well. So in this way, we reach the next generation. So people provide the variability, they provide the fitness measure, and then the Pareto frontier of the solution is fed back to the participants. When does this whole, whole process end? When we reach a consensus. That's one way of, uh, of, uh, of stopping. A second way is... So this uh, consensus can be seen either as a solution that is universally endorsed or even as a set of solutions which are universally endorsed. When this happens, sometimes it's good to uh, keep on just trying to integrate them so that you find a single way, but it's not really necessary. You can just have a list of elements and they all, and everybody just agree on them all. And another way is we get stuck. It is possible to get stuck. So far it happened really rarely, like only a couple of times, but it, sometimes uh, uh, some of the uh, solution that we wished uh, did not really represent the whole community. A lot of people got bored in the process. And so the, the people at the end who reached the consensus were the few people who really kept on staying over there. This is one of the weak parts of the whole thing. And this is, in fact, the last point, which is we get bored. It is a, there is a problem because with people having to evaluate every solution and then having to evaluate the mutations of those solutions, and then keep on doing this, it's incredible how little patience people have. Even after four or five generations, people just stop and, uh, and they say, well, we've given, I've given whatever solution I wanted to give, and they don't even vote anymore. And then the whole system collapses into whatever the only two people who have remained over there agree. 
and then it doesn't really mean a lot. So, so one of the big problems is trying to find ways to convince people to remain and keep on working till the end. And then it's normally like 10 generations, it's not, you know, we're not speaking about 100 generations. So we set up a, a website uh, which is called the Vilfredo Goes to Athens, uh, and where Vilfredo represents uh, the Pareto solution. Pareto, Vilfredo Pareto was the Italian economist who invented the Pareto frontier, and Athens, uh, that's where democracy came from. And, and we asked a certain number of questions, one, one of them that where we are very proud to have found a solution is uh, which is the meaning of life. So we have found for all of you now here, what is the meaning of life? And if you want, I would be able to, to tell it. By the way, we had seven generations over there, 11 people participated. There were only four people at the, at the end agreeing on this, but actually a lot of the people who, who participated before also agreed on this solution. This solution pretty much appeared around generation three, and it has remained over there for all this time. This is the website, and it's called the Vilfredo Goes to Agents, and these are the various questions. When someone writes a question, it arrives over here, then people, uh, questions that are waiting to be answered are over here, questions that are waiting to be voted are over here, and questions that have reached unanimity are over here. So we've applied this principle to various questions that were presented. Some of them were about politics, and what is the best form of government, what are the different ways in which a citizen can interact with their government, uh, what are plausible ways for humanity to tackle universal issues. Some of those questions just needed one generation and everybody agreed immediately. Uh, some others needed five, six, seven, ten generations. There is no one who has reached more than about 12 generations so far. Um, now this was a, a very interesting question which was, suppose there was no copyright law, how would the world be different? Interestingly, after one generation everybody agreed that art would still happen, and that was the uh, uh, unanimity. But this did not really answer the question, because the question was wider. But unanimity was found. So at that point, someone opened again another question, saying, "We know that art would uh, would still happen, and we know it because we've agreed on it on the other question. But uh, what would be the uh, what will happen to business if there was no copyright to the publishing business, to the to the music business, to the cinema business, and so on?" And people discussed on this quite a lot, and eventually we found an agreement on that too. Uh, and then there were some that were discussed when the, uh, the, health, uh, the, the health system in the US was being discussed also. Uh, also, what would be universally acceptable solution to the abortion dispute, and things about the torture memo, and so on. These were more things that had to do with politics, uh, with a particular moment in politics. And then, uh, as I said, uh, this, uh, this system comes out uh, from, a, from a group, uh, out of some of the discussion in this group, which this group is called meta-government. And um, so some of the questions were, were, and uh, this has been used uh, inside this group to find a solution about uh, naming issues and uh, how, to, uh, how to set up things and so on. Uh, how, might a non-programmer participate in meta government was a particularly interesting one where, where a lot of solutions were, were presented, uh, accepted and then combined together. Mm, then it's, a, it, it's also been used in a self-referential way, uh, so people use it to define what questions should be answered in the frequently asked questions, uh, what are the urgent things to be done, uh, this is an interesting one. How to avoid never-ending questions? Now, this is a biased question. It's a biased question because it's assumed that people don't want never-ending questions. But what if people are happy to have never-ending questions? And in fact, the person asked the question said, how to avoid never-ending questions? And the unanimity of people, after a long discussion, the unanimity of people said, 
if the if a question is not does not reach its unanimity, it means that it's we are not ready to move on and we should keep on discussing it. So essentially, they they haven't answered the question. They refused the question. They said this question is exposed. And uh, another one, what shall we do about proposals that are against the law? And uh, how should we proceed to open up a new trade? This now the trade is open source at the time it wasn't. So this was about uh, how to practically do it. Uh, and again, many issues and, uh, and the relation with other websites. Uh, when a yes and no question was asked, the answer was uh, this is not an open question. Please uh, reframe this as an open question and post it again. Uh, questions have been presented in Spanish, some questions were about role-playing games, some person wanted to know what setting would, uh, should he use. Uh, and this one is an interesting one. Uh, this was between me and a friend of mine, where we were deciding about uh, what to do in the holiday. But uh, look at the question above. This is a meta-question. We didn't even know how to ask a question, and of course it's really important how do you ask a question, because that is bringing a lot of bias on the whole, uh, on the way in which the question will be answered. So we ask the first question about the question. Let us decide when, where, and what we should do this summer. No, what should be the question about this summer, and should this be binding? This was the meta question. And then the question, I think, was this one. Maybe I'm so sometimes it's, it's important and good to go one step further and actually start to ask a meta question about how to ask a question and then ask the question. And uh, now, the way in which uh, Vilfredo has been, has been coded uh, with people being or not being able to comment each other, with people being able or not being able to, to comment the various solution to speak between each other, if the, the various solutions are anonymous or not, really changes the way uh, the, the program works. Again, technology affects a society. And this is something that has, for what I know, no formal studies in academia. For some reason, we are realizing right now how the way in which, uh, for example, if you make a discussion board, the way in which you set up the discussion board, even if you if you call the, if you say that someone add someone as a friend or follow him or stalk him or just look at what he's doing or make a connection, just the way in which you reframe this particular word can totally change the society that it's coming up. And we are observing this on and on again around the, the internet because. Uh, we have thousands of experiments right now, and they come up with a totally different, uh, totally different systems. So just think uh, how blogs are different depending if the comments are, um, are in a tree structure or not in a tree structure, and, and so on. For small, small blogs this doesn't really matter, but for blogs that have hundreds or thousands of comments each day, that's really matter, that's really a, a big issue. So, one of the big problems was anonymity of the proposers. That is, uh, if someone proposed something, should he be anonymous, totally always, only for some time, or should he be not anonymous? Well, we found out that if he is uh, totally anonymous, people tend to vote, to write something, then vote on it, and not vote for anything else. And this is enough to present, uh, to bring this to the Pareto Front. Vice versa, if there is no anonymity at all, the result is that people tend to vote on something just because it is. Uh, uh, people tend to vote on something just because they trust the person who has wrote it, uh, just out of sympathy. So they don't do their homework to get it uh, uh, well done. So the, the solution is just to have a temporal anonymity where people, where you don't know when you are voting but after it's revealed. Oh, I voted on uh, uh, something about this guy that I really don't like. I didn't know if it was him. And so uh, the question are, who can write a proposal? Can everybody write a proposal? Or only some people? Who choose them? 
uh, who can vote on a proposal? Everybody, some people, another option. Only the people who did not propose someone, something. So that you eliminate the possibility that someone vote for his own uh, option. Or a sample of the population, maybe a representative sample of the population. Those are only for options. Uh, of course, some of those require to have a lot of people. So we have it, uh, had the time to, uh, to test it. And can people join in uh, through the process? Uh, what if we get a group of people and we keep them in the room until they found an agreement? Or if we let anybody come in or come out? The whole, uh, the whole democratic process will be totally different. Uh, how is it going to be different? Who knows? So, there is a relation between the technology and the emerging society, and this is generally uh, unstudied. There is a lot of research that should be done over here. Now, one of, the, one of the, probably the most interesting result that we found, apart of the algorithm by itself, which maybe I think is interesting, is that the algorithm is easier to reach a consensus if the question is important. The more people are really interested in the question, the more they are bound to it, the more they will, they, they will find a consensus. So why is it? Well, I have some theories about it. Uh, the algorithm is fast. It only takes maybe five, ten generations to reach a consensus. Normally, genetic algorithms normally need about need a hundred or thousands of generations. Why is it so fast? Because human beings are intelligent. They already discard a lot of solutions that they know will not reach nothing, and they only try the one that they think they, they might, there might be a possibility. So sometimes no consensus can be reached. So it's not like everybody, every time you will find a consensus. And as I said, it's easy for people to get older, that is a problem. So one of the, uh, the interesting thing about this system is that each user has veto power. If you do not want a solution to be there, you have full control on the solution. You just don't have to vote it. And there will be no way for that solution to reach unanimity because you will not be part of it. You have to keep on voting and keep on voting the other solutions. And if there is no solution that, that you are willing to vote, it means that you have not proposed at least one solution yourself. So, you, in a sense, it's your, it's your fault. Each user is present in the Pareto front. Everybody who has voted will be present in the Pareto front because there is no way in which something you, can vote, you have voted can be dominated by something that you have not voted. So, the Pareto front will include something from every, from every person. So, the Pareto front represents everybody. We can really say that it represents the society. Now, sometimes different groups will not merge. As I said, there is not always a solution. But each group will find its best representative proposal. In this way, a system like Wilfredo can be used as a pre-study over a democratic process. You first run something like Wilfredo to find what are the optimal possible solutions. And then, if you haven't find a, 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 a if you haven't found a solution where everybody agrees, or for any reason you want, in any case, to go through a voting system, a formal voting, you take those solutions, you present them to the whole, the, the solution of the Pareto Front after many generations. So those are kind of stable solutions that a lot of people agree on them, and you present them to the population at large, and everybody votes on them. And, and at that point, you have the normal voting theory. Everybody can write a proposal in the Pareto Front. So you can write a proposal, but then you are voting. If you are voting your own proposal, you are effectively writing something in the Pareto front. So for this reason, and normally social constraint will stop people from doing this, but the Pareto front does not mean the best proposal. Someone can write a totally crazy proposal, and, uh, and then it would still arrive in the Pareto front. If something in the Pareto front don't think that it's going to be a legal, a good, and acceptable solution we had, uh, proposals in the Pareto Front that suggested to kill some people. We had all sorts of crazy proposals in the Pareto Front. It does not matter. If you do not agree with that, don't vote it. And you are, you are essentially vetoing that proposal to go forward. Now, this is a, another topic 
which uh, I've added recently, and I'll, uh, I'll, I think this is uh, very interesting. This is about why I think the whole system actually does uh, scale. Now, suppose uh, that you have uh, two... This is used a lot in management. You suppose that you have a question, for example, what uh, car should I buy? And then you have, uh, you can plot all the car according to two uh, values. One is the speed of the car and the other is the cost, uh, one over the cost of the car, so something that, uh, how cheap the car is. And, and then you have a certain number of, uh, of solutions that are cars. Now, I've, uh, I've only put uh, solutions that obviously could, uh, would be in a sort of Pareto front over here. I haven't put anything inside here. Of course, when you buy cars, there's much, much more possibilities around. We're keeping it simple. So then what you do, well, what people do in management is that they just uh, measure everything and they say, okay, A is greater than E is greater than C is greater than, C, uh, than G for the speed, whereas in the other direction you have uh, that uh, G is greater than C is greater than E is greater than A, so no points dominate any other, so everything is in the Pareto front. Fair enough. Now suppose, so this is the Pareto front, now suppose that you have two people. Now each of those people have a certain desire of car, whereas I want something which is, it's more important for me speed respect to cost, so I'm willing to pay so much money to have, uh, to have a car going faster, whereas someone else wants to pay less money, it doesn't really care about the speed, it's more important that it's cheap. And you could have more, more dimensions over here, you know, how much is polluting, the size of the car, and what colors are available, how many colors are available, or if a particular color is available, or whatever. So, now, when we are actually measuring according to this line, those points, we get a different order. <coughs> Whereas, uh, and so, while if we are measuring according to this other line, the points, we get another order again. Now, respect to this order, we get that E dominates A. In fact, you see, E is greater than C is greater than A is greater than G. So E dominates A over here, and E dominates A over here, C over G over E over A, so E is greater than A, so E dominates A, so we can take off A, we similarly can take off G, so we have a Pareto front, which is E and C. This is a different Pareto front than before. By changing our base, we've moved from one Pareto front to another. Now, what is... Now here I'm making a claim, and the claim has not been proven so far. I am pretty sure it can be proven. I'm actually working on this when I have time. In fact, I... And the claim is that if you have a Pareto front, if you have multiple users, or in any case another base, which is, a, which is in the first quadrant respect to the, to the first base, so you know where, where every, where every uh, line, every vector, would be a positive relation between the two, so it would be a, a line of the form y is equal to a multiplied by x, where a is a positive number, if you have a, a set of those lines that forms a base, the Pareto front will be a subset of the objective Pareto front. And the more those lines open up, the more the Pareto front merge and become one, the two Pareto front go one. So if this is true, and I claim this to be true, then the fact of actually adding other people will, does not actually change what the Pareto front is, I mean, it, you can lose element, but you will not gain them. In fact, no, adding people, we will never lose element in a Pareto front. You might only gain them. But if those people are always inside those extreme one, you will not actually get more people in the Pareto front, provided that everybody votes for real. 
that everybody really evaluates the questions. And uh, that is the problem with, like in the Homo economicus, you know, we assume that he, ha he knows everything, and the fact that he does not know everything, this is why we get, uh, you know, bubbles in economy and a lot of, uh, a lot of problems. So, we can have all those people and the Pareto front will still be the same. So, if uh, you have the Pareto front of a group of people whose values make them evaluate proposals according to a line y is equal to a times x with a bigger than zero will be a subset of the Pareto front according to the general values. And um, so, okay, what are the assumptions that we've made to do this. Why, when is this true? Now, the first assumption is that people don't make errors in evaluating proposals. Now, this is a big assumption, but if we get a system where people are just uh, evaluating few proposals and they're not really studying them, then uh, we can actually stay with that. And values, so we want to have values that The different people tend to have uh, similar values. What do I mean? I might uh, decide, I might think that the cost is more important than the speed of the car. Jason might uh, think the opposite. But we both uh, think that, uh, you know, how much it's cheap the car and how much does it, uh, what's the speed uh, are the element. None, neither of us would want a car that costs a lot just because it costs a lot. If we want it because it costs a lot, it might be because there is something else, for example, status. But then this is a different uh, dimension. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an element. Take another one, take, um, take abortion. Now, people who are pro-life and people who are pro-choice, they both are against abortion. They just put a different weight. Some people would say, the people who are pro-choice, they don't say, you know, we want to have abortion. They say we want to have as little abortion as possible. We just want to, to have choice and the choice is more important. Whereas people who are pro-life, they don't say we don't want to have choice. They do say we want to have choice. We don't want to have people having to, be, uh, to, uh, to do things. Uh, but then they actually think that this other element is more important. So the values are actually the same, they're just putting different weights on those various values. Now what are the assumptions that we do not make? And uh, there is no a priori knowledge that is needed over those values involved. I mean, I explained the whole thing about cost and speed, but in many problems we don't know what those uh, values, actually the objective values over there are. Are. We just know how people have been ranking those elements directly, and that's enough. We don't know what are those values, we don't know how many are those values. But uh, if someone seems to have radically different values, uh, sometimes you can explain this by adding an extra dimension. For example, someone who wants to have a costly car, well, maybe it's because it has a uh, um, because it gives them statues. So maybe there are other ways to give a statues which does not involve having a, a costly car that would actually dominate both the costly car and then this person would be perfectly happy to have something which costs less but you know it still gives them a lot of statues because it was designed just for them by whatever person who was over there or was you know it was the car of this person or whatever. So there's some future work that I am. So I want to formalize, of course, all the work about objective and subjective Pareto front. I'm seeing different applications, not just over here. Uh, there's working on the website. I mean, we're really trying to get this uh, up and running and trying to, to make it uh, easier for the people. So feedback would be absolutely welcome. And of course, there's the scaling problems. We want to understand how does this scale. So from the scaling problem, maybe having a local distributed system, that might be a way. And, and then there is another thing, because if people who have radically different ways of thinking makes the number of dimensions go up, which means they make the Pareto front increase a lot, then 
maybe you can spot people who have just been voting randomly because if you take them off and you put them in the Pareto front just make a huge jump so you can check for every person and find out what are the person that you know they kind of are smooth and, and what are the person that they get in and the Pareto front are the five new elements that would just be, be dominated by everybody else and this might represent someone who has a radically different point of view but it might also represent someone who is just you know putting things at random it's it's a it's something to be studied and to check if it's true or not of course there is a possibility to to misuse it and there's been a certain number of people involved we've discussed this in the meta government group meta government .org. there's a wiki and and so on if you want to uh, chris anderson uh, uh, he's in um, Brighton. He does a uh, 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 he does a website. He's uh, really good in a website, a social website, uh, and um, Web 2.0. And all these uh, ideas came out uh, the Pareto front and so on. To use it over here came out of a discussion with him. He made the first version with me of uh, of the website. Uh, Giovanni Spagnolo. We tried to get a European grant uh, on this. Uh, together and there was a lot of discussions and Luis Paquette he was uh, we we have been working on objective versus subjective he's from uh, um, from Coimbra University and Derek Patterson is um, a, a friend of mine from Edinburgh he he also was in Brighton for a period some of you might know him and he is uh, right now is the person who is more involved with me actually even more than me in writing the website uh, the rooms we just have it. Uh, he have been the coding for the rooms and other things that uh, that you will find over here. And uh, I think uh, this is it. Okay.